Okay, so this, we're actually gonna go see this. This is at Living Web at their other site. So I guess we'll talk more about this when we're actually up there. We're gonna go visit this. But just to show how we laid this out, so they had this sort of established, so they run animals in these alleyways, but these berms that they built, they get like weed whacked a couple times a year, but that's about it. So, you know, there's blackberries and all kinds of stuff in there. To deal with that, they bought uh, this like paper landscaping mulch. And so we rolled out strips of that. We then, you know, made holes in that and planted the plants in and then came back over and covered uh, with wood chips. Honestly, after seeing it later, so we did that last fall, about a year ago, um, I came back and planted more in a different spot in the spring and this paper you couldn't even find under the wood chips. So my feeling in general is that that stuff's not super effective. I don't know, you know, if you're on a more limited budget, I don't think I'd mess with it. So part of though why, you know, this is definitely the major aspect with hazelnuts especially is getting them through the first three seasons of growth, minimizing weed pressure, getting as much moisture and fertility to them as you can in any way is like, that's how you're gonna actually get the best first step on a planting. So in the area, so at my place, so this is at my place. So this is, you know, there's a row of hazelnuts here and there's one here. And you can see these electric lines here. Pigs came out of here on this day I took this picture. So you can kind of see there's some bare ground. There's some thatch going on. This is three weeks later. That's the regrowth in that alley. So the point I'm getting at is that you have to be doing some amount of maintenance to be able to give these guys the best step forward you can. At my place, I'm out in these plantings pretty much every day. So dealing with landscape fabric or mulch or whatever is not totally crucial because I'm out there. If I see that the grass is growing up over top of the plants, I can spend an hour dealing with that versus at this planting here, it's not necessarily that way. Nobody might go to that area for two months. Like that wouldn't be rare. Um, so in that case, you would want to do a more heavy handed upfront uh, understory management on that. Or, you know, absolutely ideal if you've got an easy way to set up like irrigation or something, that's gonna get you off to the best step. But again, spending money on this sort of thing, personally I try to do that as little as I possibly can. Yeah, anyways. When you were um, doing your thinning and stuff, did you notice any changes in like the herbaceous component, like the seed bank, anything interesting come up? Oh yeah, definitely. It definitely, um, like when you start removing woody species out of a closed canopy, you start getting a lot of grasses and annual and biennial forbs that you would not get in an established forest. So one of the ones, again, this is a little bit out of the scope of what we're uh, focused on, but giant ragweed, I've had huge flushes of, and that is, at this point, my second favorite plant after hazelnuts. It's about 35% protein at the peak in about June. Uh, it's highly palatable to every animal I've tried to feed it to. It grows up to 14 to 15 feet in a season. The seeds are super dense protein and fat, really awesome for like songbird populations. Grouse love it a lot, turkeys. Um, yeah, awesome plant. Um, but yeah, just in general, that's sort of, you know, so the, you know, the basic, the soil differences between like an early succession landscape and a late stage succession like closed canopy forest is that the soils tend to be bacterially dominated in the early stages and fungally dominated in the later stages. It tends to, it definitely diversifies that matrix when you start opening that stuff up. Um, you know, all those grasses and forbs and stuff can germinate in the leaf litter and then start getting a foothold in the soil and then over time sort of build up their own little pocket. Um, yeah, but then that's, you know, the dynamic of how to keep that from just turning back into tulip poplar is animals. Burning would be, is definitely awesome. Uh, personally, I just have not learned how to do it and 
don't really want to play around with that. So, <laughs> uh, but I've got friends that are super into that. Um, yeah, definitely a potential understory burning. That's those folks out in California. That's how they manage their oaks. Um, that's so with oaks, especially it actually helps with the weevil population, which is a major issue we'll talk about. Um, basically it's these bugs that lay their eggs in the nuts that then the larval stage eats out the nut meat and then overwinters in the soil. They would burn the understory out immediately after they finished harvest and that helps, you know, it's definitely not gonna eliminate that population, but any of the larvae that are in that upper layer are just gonna get roasted. That was actually done up to Olympia to oh, yeah. Northern California to Olympia. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm sure it was, you know, fire agriculture is like globally very well established. So I'm sure that was common in a lot of areas. That's, I mean, essentially that's what people were doing here in the chestnut forest, same idea. Yeah. Um, once the hazelnuts are more matured, can they possibly act as like a living fence for your animals? They possibly can. There's a, so really the most sort of extensive use of that sort of thing is in the UK and parts of Europe. As far as I have seen, that's not a common species that they use for hedges. Um, but their hazel species tends to be more of a single stem tree, whereas ours is like a multi-stem. Um, so at least from what I've seen, I think it would be possible, but personally I would not rely on it. I wouldn't like plant that on a neighbor's property line and expect my pigs aren't gonna go over there. <laughs> so, but it definitely, you know, like I've had, I, I regularly have pigs that will not respect single or double strand electric fences in an area like this where there's a solid line of hazels planted at three feet, they won't go through it because they know they can't just bolt through it. So yeah, so I'd say maybe. <laughs> yeah, I was curious about a coppicing and the firewood usage. Yeah. I'm just wondering with like black locusts, how you've seen, cause you're talking about coppicing that in poplar and Right. I feel like it's viable to do like a, a cut and coppice for firewood with locust. My experience with black locust is that it doesn't mature its heartwood until like 15 to 20 years. Um, and so up until that point, it's not significantly, it doesn't burn significantly hotter than a bunch of other stuff. So what I do, the main species that I coppice and pollard for both fodder and firewood is mulberry. It's got super high protein leaves that are more palatable than locusts to more different animals. Um, the wood is almost as high BTU uh, and the fruit is then like a bonus, which that's a pretty awesome bonus, so. Yeah. And how many year rotations do you usually do with the mulberry? I, I'm actually trying, I'm sort of playing around a lot with it to get the best answer to that. There are actually books on how they deal with it to feed silkworms. There's like a massively <laughs> intense scientific field in Asia of like how to manage mulberries. Um, but I ideally am cutting them annually because I'm putting them in areas that are managed pretty intensively and inevitably there's a point where I need to feed my animals every year. Uh, the other thing is that in, so if you wait more than one year to come back and cut them, you know, mulberry grows very fast. So that stem that you're cutting will be like one and a half to two inches, at which point it being able to callus back over that is kind of iffy. Whereas at one year, it's usually an inch or lower, which is realistic, it'll callus back over. And that's kind of the main goal in that continual cutting is you want it to be able to build up scar tissue and not be just rotting. Yeah. Do you copy them to the ground at what, what, what height? Most of those I pollard like six feet off the ground so my sheep won't just defoliate them and kill them. Yeah. Anything else on layout management? Um, Okay, well, so at some point, I guess it's a little, is it actually raining right now? Yeah. Okay, 
So at some point, the plan is to carpool over to the site where we planted these hazels um, and just sort of talk more intensively about all of those aspects of like, you know, genetic selection and layout and management and all that stuff. Um, we also have acorn crust pizza dough that we're planning to make pizzas and bake. Ideally, we're hoping to get the baking done while we're gone because it's apparently gonna get really hot in here for that. Um, but then I also have a whole spiel on acorn processing that we're gonna do. I guess if it's raining, we need to try to wait. So let's maybe go ahead and talk about acorn processing and then we'll see what the weather's doing during that. If there's a convenient point where it's not raining and it looks like we can head out, then we'll go ahead and do that. Okay. Okay, yeah, that'd be good. Bathroom, water, break. 